This video is supported by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform for your online presence. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. In addition to the crazy progress always going on at Starbase in Texas, a full stack of Starship should occur and a Starship presentation for Thursday has been announced. I'm also diving into this. Yep, that is right, the new facility at Roberts Road is already making significant progress, and we even have signs of similar platforms to those at Starbase. The Cosmo SkyMed mission this past week was a unique one for SpaceX, just check this out. Then Falcon 9 took to the sky two more times as well with the NROL87 mission, another Starlink launch, and yes, I've got some other neat things to touch on as well. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Another jam-packed week at Starbase with a lot of news regarding Starship's future orbital launch vehicles and the near completion of Mechazilla's primary systems. Last week, scaffolding was added back onto the orbital launch tower, and after what looked to be some repairs to the rails last week, the water bags have since been attached and filled with water. There was no messing around with a lifting test rapidly underway. Shortly after this, the water bags were removed, hopefully indicating that this test was successful. So yes, I think it is very likely that the next major test that we see involving Mechazilla's arms is a full stack of Ship 20 onto Booster 4. Of course, Elon Musk has announced that a Starship presentation should occur Thursday this coming week at 8pm Texas time, also confirming that a full stack for the presentation should be the case. SpaceX had painted all of the Raptor engine nozzles early in the week, which was already a good sign that the ship was ready to be presented fully stacked for the second time. This time, there will be no crane required, so I thought it might be interesting to explore the operational sequence of the arms during this process. Firstly, Booster 4 will be rolled right next to the orbital launch mount in a position and orientation where it is able to be picked up. The arms will then lower down wide open before closing in just below the two stacking pins on the booster's interstage, which are just below the grid fins here. After this, the stabilizer bars will swing down and engage the booster's secondary load points here. This will ensure that the booster is fixed into place with no dangerous oscillations or awkward misalignments with the orbital launch mount due to wind or even an uneven load distribution. The arms will then be raised up, lifting the booster off the transport stand, officially making it the first vehicle to ever be hoisted into the air by Mechazilla. Before the booster can be fully lifted off the transport stand though, the clamps will have to be disengaged and moved into the service position. This creates a safe radius for the booster to be lifted without the risk of the engines impacting the clamps. Now, when the booster is clear and lifted high enough, the arms will rotate until it is right above the launch mount, and it will then be lowered gently into the launch ring. The 20 hold down clamps here will close in to hold the booster, and the quick disconnect arms should then open out and connect up all of the necessary systems. Once everything is checked out and booster 4 is firmly held in place by the clamps, the arms will open up and be raised above the booster so that they can turn towards the awaiting starship. The chopsticks will then be rotated and lowered back to prepare prepare for this process once more in a similar way for Ship 20. Now, the big question is how the chopsticks will take hold. We've seen over the past months these holds under the forward fins of the ship, which we've always expected would end up with similar pins inserted, but I've never seen that confirmed anywhere. What do you think? This is quite interesting to me. Regardless, it does seem clear that the tower arms will attach here in some way to lift it. It will then be moved gently up over the quick disconnect arm and lowered carefully onto booster 4. Once in place, the stage separation clamps are fully engaged and the tower arms will open for the last time completing the entire stacking process. That is really going to be amazing to see. So at the build site this week, an interesting four-ring redesigned ship aft section was spotted. This combines the previously separated skirt and the dome sleeve into one four-ring high aft section. So this features substantial changes, including a relocated quick disconnect panel that is one ring higher than it was on ship 20 to 23. This section was then flipped upside down to be able to sleeve over the aft dome, which occurred in the cover of darkness sometime last Saturday night, almost a week ago. By the morning, we had a completely sleeved aft dome, and before long, it was rolled back into the tent for further work. 
Now, you may be wondering how the quick disconnect arm on the tower will be able to mate with this panel now that it is higher. I was originally thinking that the booster would probably need to be shortened by one ring to allow for this. However, there is really no reason for SpaceX to do this. We are now thinking that the quick disconnect panel on the arm can be fairly easily reconfigured and then simply moved up a little. Now, we did mention Booster 8's forward dome sleeve being flipped last week, as well as its integration with the dome itself. But just to add to this, during the flip, Mary with NASA Spaceflight spotted a change to the system that connects and locks the ship onto the booster. Previous boosters, the interstage had pins that locked into slots on the ship. But now with Booster 8 and future vehicles, we assume that system is now flipped. Now the three slots and the locking mechanism is on the booster and the three pins are now instead attached to the ship ship's aft section. We had the first three sections of the fourth level of the wide bay lifted up and placed onto the rest of the structure as well. Weather permitting, this level of the wide bay could even be largely completed by the time this video goes live, so you'll have to check out the latest footage there. At the most, I'd expect to see one additional level added, but it's unclear how tall this section would be. These structural columns seen laying on top of the concrete barriers next to the high bay appear to be the same height as the ones seen here. Now, these could be one of the three central columns columns that are located in the middle of the wall in between each section, or we could be looking at an additional level of sections that are identical to the ones that we've seen so far. That would make the wide bay just under 20 metres taller than the adjacent high bay structure. Ground Truth here also captured the massive bridge crane not that long ago, which is one of two delivered to be used in the wide bay once ready to be installed. Over in the nose cone production tent, one of the new smooth nose cones, possibly assigned to Ship 24, has received the jig that is used to line up and attach the flap systems. It's going to be very interesting, I think, to see if the fins are mounted any differently in this version of the nose. Elon Musk mentioned the forward fin position would be adjusted mid last year for future vehicles. Could we be seeing this for the first time on this nose? Now, some very exciting news this week, I think, regarding the construction of SpaceX's facilities around the Kennedy Space Center. Here we have the Sentinel-2 satellite imagery as it passed over the Space Coast just days ago, as shared by Harry here. Well, let's just zoom in. A little more, just a little more, and enhanced. There we go. Wow, technology is amazing. Of course, if you didn't spot it on my Twitter feed, Greg Scott and I organized a helicopter flight over Roberts Road midweek when the weather conditions were finally perfect for it. If you don't recall, the Roberts Road facility is right here around the KSC. This is quite an interesting shot in particular, I think. If we zoom in, you might see a few structures that look very similar to what we've seen at Starbase over the past year. These include the assembly fixture pieces, which are used as jigs to build the orbital launch tower sections, as well as to transport each completed section over to the launch pad. Close by and along with this, the new concrete foundations for assembling the tower sections were also spotted. These are all the same structures that we've seen at the Sanchez site at Starbase in Texas when the tower our sections were being assembled there. So yes, there is much to be discovered at the Roberts Road facility over the coming months, but just think of the story so far at Boca Chica. The incredible milestones achieved to get both the construction site and the launch site ready for an orbital test flight. The invention of this gigantic robot tower to catch the largest rocket to ever fly right out of the sky. Something yet unproven as a system, but one that inspires us to dream of this crazy future where launching mass to orbit on a re usable vehicle is orders of magnitude more cost effective than it is today. I look forward to that being considered commonplace and we are just looking at the very first base of operations. A massive thank you to Ground Truth for recording and sharing this magnificent video to the world. Please do check out the full one from the link in the description. The higher resolution version with beautiful audio is just inspiring. Thanks as always to all of you for supporting all of the members of the community out there. That helps them a great deal. And just quickly as well, I've had so many comments over the past few weeks from subscribers saying that they've been unsubscribed from us here. Just a quick remember to double check that you're still with us. I swear YouTube makes people jump through enough hoops already to be notified of videos. You no longer just need to be subscribed but also have bells ticked and all this stuff just to have a chance of seeing the videos pop up. But anyway, thanks for being here with us as well as interacting with the videos. It all helps the team and I bring it all to you each Saturday. 
Now, SpaceX's CSG-2 mission on Monday evening, January the 31st, was the first of three scheduled Falcon 9 launches this week. I'll jump into that in just a moment, but quickly a huge thank you to Squarespace today for their support of this video. Squarespace is an incredible all-in-one platform to build your online presence to promote yourself, your business, or your brand. Even if you have little experience in creating your own online content, you will feel immediately right at home creating a website with Squarespace. You don't even need experience web developers or design skills, you just get started with the mountain of templates to choose from. Once you have found one that is right for your brand, that is it. You instantly have a shell already built waiting for your incredible content to be ended. To diagnose how effective your content is for you, you have at your disposal the terrific inbuilt analytics as well. Perhaps you have a cause to support as well. Simply collect donations using the inbuilt payment system such as PayPal, Apple Pay, Stripe or Venmo. It is all super simple to set up. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash marcushouse and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. Now, SpaceX's CSG-2 mission was actually super impressive, specifically because of the amazing footage of the ascent. Now, we saw a bunch of launch delays here with this one, with the original timeline slipping several days due to unfavorable weather. Then, just when things were looking great on Sunday evening, a cruise liner strayed right into the no-go zone, triggering a range violation and another launch scrub. That was frustrating, but we then had the liftoff finally occurring on the following evening on Monday, the 31st of January, just after 6 p.m. local time from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral. The Falcon 9 hugged the coastline here, heading south on its ascent before that dogleg maneuver. The payload, of course, was Italy's Cosmo SkyMed second generation Earth observation satellite. Here it was on track to a polar sun synchronous orbit some 620 kilometers in altitude. The thing here that really got me though was the breathtaking ground camera work with stage separation and fairing jettison. I just absolutely love this footage and I hope that this is something that we get to see a lot more of with future launches. So for the second time this year, we saw a booster returning to the Cape almost eight minutes later, making its way back home to landing zone one, just under 10 kilometers south of the launch site. Interestingly, this booster was also the very first Falcon Heavy side booster to be modified into a Falcon 9 first stage. This involves steps like the removal of the nose cone and other flight hardware as well. The history, in fact, on this particular booster, I think is quite unique. It was the side booster used in both the Arabsat 6A mission and the STP-2 missions using Falcon Heavy from 2019. Yep, 2019, and that was the last time that we witnessed a Falcon Heavy launch with that STP-2 mission mid that year. So yes, it was certainly nice to see this booster getting some new experience here on its third ever flight, and the very first as a core booster. So there we go, yet another beautiful landing with uninterrupted footage all the way to the ground. The first of two missions that returned to the landing site just this week, which is normally a fairly rare thing to see. Now, the second stage engine performed two restarts on this mission in order to place the payload into the desired orbit one hour after liftoff. And there it is right there, the deployment of the CSG-2 satellite, bringing a successful conclusion to this particular mission. Now, this has been a long time coming for the Italian Space Agency. As one of 22 member states of the European Space Agency, Italy is party to an agreement between ESA members that they send their payloads to orbit on either Ariane or Vega C launch vehicles wherever possible. Launching here on a Falcon 9 was necessary due to Ariane's schedule conflicts and the ongoing issues with the Vega C launch vehicle. So this makes this particular launch here by SpaceX a very rare event indeed. Oh, and be sure to check out the amazing work by our great friend Greg Scott working some magic here with multiple camera angles to capture this launch. Just remember, it took five separate attempts out there to actually photograph this flight, something that I think people don't often appreciate. It isn't just the launches that the amazing photographer are capturing, so the load of launches that are missed due to all of the scrubs. The action didn't stop here though with two more Falcon 9 launches, all three of them within four days, which is just incredible. Next on the pad of course was the NROL 87 mission, the first from the west coast for 2022. Sitting at Space Launch Complex 4 at Vandenberg Space Force Base on February the 2nd, we have the classified US government satellite for the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO. An absolutely beautiful day with the weather perfect for this launch, with 
with no issues apparent and a green status for the range, it was all go for liftoff. And with that, this shiny brand new Falcon 9 vehicle rose from the launch pad, pitching down range and heading south for a polar orbit. A terrific view here as the climb progressed smoothly yet again, reaching main engine cutoff and separation just after two minutes. Unfortunately, this is where the coverage ends for the second stage due to the nature of the classified payload. It's what? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. But we do know, thanks to the NRO later confirming, that the deployment was a success. The real treat for this mission though was to see the booster flip over and head back towards the landing zone, in this case landing zone 4. Honestly, these landing zone returns never get old for me. More great views here as the now flight proven booster streaked across the sky. The dual footage shared here by SpaceX is just incredible as well. Both feeds continuous all the way to the ground. That perspective from this landing zone in particular is terrific given that elevated view. The legs were out and touched down. And as you can see, a picture perfect landing. Yet another beautiful set of landing shots. Some pretty sweet drone footage was also released soon after as well by SpaceX on Twitter. Both the launch and the landing view. Uh, when will Twitter allow higher quality video because this is just incredible. Safely on the ground a mere 8 minutes and 15 seconds after liftoff and a new milestone for the NRO as well making this their first mission to include the landing of a rocket. The next flight for this particular booster should also be flown on an NRO mission as well so it's great to see them embracing the reusability of the Falcon 9. So switching all the way back to the East Coast now, just across the way from where we saw the CSG-2 mission launch on Monday evening, another batch of 49 Starlink satellites were ready to go and this is the third flight in just days. So yet another successful liftoff of a Falcon 9, this time from Pad 39A at the KSC. This routine mission hurled the satellites into orbit. We did get the fairing deploy shot in this one and it was sadly the only glimpse of the satellites in this feed. Another choppy video feed of the landing there on the drone ship a shortfall of gravitas waiting downrange. At this point it would be more unusual if we saw something going wrong with the landing. And yes, there we go, the mission was done and dusted in just moments. It was a short one with SpaceX cutting the stream just 10 minutes after the launch due to the lack of coverage available for the Starlink deployment. Instead we waited for SpaceX to confirm that deployment on Twitter afterward. So just how many active Starlink satellites are up there now? Astronomer Jonathan McDowell's tweet here shed some light on this. Including this mission, there are 1920, and this year is set to be one for the record books for SpaceX. An ambitious manifest of 52 launches for 2022, and six have already been completed so far. Things are off to a very good start. Okay, so a quick update here. Back in early December last year, we saw the launch of the rideshare mission STP-3 by United Launch Alliance. Making up the assorted payloads was the Laser Communications Relay Demonstration, or LCRD vehicle. Well, NASA's experimental two-way optical relay satellite has achieved a critical milestone this past week. In this tweet by NASA's Laser Communications, the first beams of laser light were transmitted through the optical telescopes. Over the next couple of months, we can expect to hear about the first experiments of transmitting actual data via laser. I just find this super exciting. With future missions also contributing to this testing regime, this is certainly one groundbreaking piece of space technology. Should things work out as they expect that it will, this has been described as a game changer for space communications back to Earth. Now I've just got to shout out this footage here by China's National Space Administration too. With China celebrating the start of their new year early this week as the Year of the Tiger, just check out what was published right here. Yep, this is the Tianwen-1 spacecraft taking a selfie as it passed in front of Mars. In this shot we can even see the North Pole of Mars covered in ice, something that we've seen before but not quite from this perspective. The resolution of the video isn't wonderful but I still find it quite amazing to be able to witness this all the same. But how did the vehicle get this shot? The arms on the vehicle extend out just a little over 1.5 meters or around 5.2 feet and then it can look back on itself and take all of this footage. It's also a very useful tool for the commanders of the vessel to use to look back and check out the health of it. Although the camera is a fairly basic instrument, it very simply provides the means to monitor its behavior and to analyze how well the materials on the spacecraft are holding up over time. As a bonus of that of course, the welder 
advocates to check out this footage, which I think is just terrific as well. Now, if you are interested in the polar ice caps on Mars, I also highly recommend checking out the data published by the European Space Agency when the Mars Express mission captured these beautiful images of the North Pole. You can see the exquisite detail here of the bright ice in contrast with the dark depressions. It is an ever-changing landscape as well with the seasons and the winds on Mars. Even though the atmosphere is minuscule in comparison to Earth, that still has quite an effect over time. Now, speaking of Mars, NASA shared some of these neat images from the Perseverance rover early in the week. It is just terrific to see the rover out there drilling yet again after the issues from late December had Percy grounded after some pebbles got stuck in the sample carousel. Since then, of course, NASA have used a series of high-tech maneuvers to remove this problem. What they did was they reversed up some rocks twisted and shook the vehicle, then presto, the pebbles fell away. <laughs> so with that, NASA announced that they were happy to go fire the sampling system up again and get right back to work. On the final day of January, NASA's Perseverance rover account on Twitter tweeted out these images showing that the rover had dug a fresh new hole right near the old one, which had its sample discarded. So yes, in addition, NASA believes that this particular sample could be one of the oldest rock samples so far. It's going to be great to see if there are any new findings that arise over this and the upcoming samples. Assuming, of course, that no more pebbles hold us up. That should have you all up to date. Thank you, as always, for watching all this way through. It's been such a busy week, so hopefully I've done it all justice. It's a tad longer than usual, this one, so thanks for sticking with me. I'm always super interested to know what I can do to improve things for you, and although it is impossible to cater for every taste, if there is anything specific you think that we should be doing, I would love to hear it. If you've enjoyed this video and aren't subscribed, hopefully this one has earned it, but if not, thanks for dropping by anyway. Also, a thank you to all of you incredible patrons right here helping to make this channel what it is. Likewise to everyone that loves our merch from the link below, remember if you have got some of it, tag me on Twitter. It's always great to see you in the gear. As always, the video appearing in the bottom left today will take you back to last week's episode if you missed it. A lot of you out there were super interested in NASA's depleted astronaut core. In the top right is the latest video, and in the bottom right, a YouTube selected video that you might enjoy. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.